Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in. This is James from Octopart. You are listening to the Control Listen podcast. I'm here with my co-host Nora and our guest today is Tom Raftery. Uh, he is a podcast legend in this space. He's been doing it since 2005, a uh, long time, had some amazing guests across his shows. Uh, the shows you may have heard of today are Digital Supply Chain and Climate Confident. We're going to be discussing some topics from both. Uh, Nora, I know you had some questions you wanted to ask, so I'll, I'll let you uh, take the lead from here. Yeah, I I thought we could begin the discussion talking about AI, since it's all everyone wants to talk about right now. And, <laughs> um, you know, what are, what are the challenges and what are the concerns that come with the integration of AI in robotics in various sectors like manufacturing, healthcare, transportation? Like, I'm, I'm interested in kind of starting the conversation with the, what are the things we should be wary of? And then maybe we can move into the benefits, the, the, the cons and to the pros. Yeah, it's, yeah, you, you're right. AI is the topic du jour. It's every, it's what everyone is talking about. And, you know, it, it's since obviously ChatGPT was released into the wild last year, November 30th, it, it went live. And uh, I was checking recently my one password vault uh, and I, I checked my ChatGPT account and I set it up around noon on the 1st of December. So ChatGPT had gone public probably 12 hours when I set up my account on it. Uh, <laughs> I, I like to be kind of a, an early mover in these things. And sure enough, it's, it's been it's really taken the world by storm. Um, the kind of concerns, there are lots of them, obviously. Uh, I, I saw just recently there was an article talking about how in healthcare uh, they ran a study across multiple AIs and they found asking them questions, medical questions, they found that there were racial biases built into a lot of the AIs, which obviously is, is quite concerning because, mm -hmm. you know, they were asking them standard medical questions and they were coming back with racially differentiated answers. So, you know, Things like that are a concern. It's the old garbage in, garbage out. If it's trained on biased data, it's going to give a biased result. So we're still at the very early stages of this. It's it's massively changing technology, but we're at early days. And a lot of these issues that we're having, you know, will be worked out in time. Um, I use ChatGPT all the time. Uh, I just as an experiment yesterday, for example, I asked it to, first of all, I, I, I told it, I gave it a description of my digital supply chain podcast, told it what it is, you know, told it what kind of uh, show it is, what the mission statement is, all that kind of thing. And I said to it, what would be a good prompt for Dali to create podcast art for this podcast. By the way, here's Apple's guidelines for creating podcast cover art. Based on that, what would be a good prompt for Dali? And sure enough, it came back with a beautiful prompt. So then I didn't go, I didn't bother going to Dali because I have ChatGPT with the Dali plugin enabled. So I just opened up a new chat, threw in the prompt that it had given me and said, could you create some, um, podcast cover art for me using this prompt. Sure enough, out it came. And I got, you know, I went, I iterated this several times and I came up with six that I really liked. And then I went over to Instagram and on Instagram, I asked people, what do you think of these six? And one guy who's a designer came back to me and said, Tom, these are really impressive. And I'm a designer. He said, the issue I have is what do I do now? <laughs> you know, because this is something it would have, you know, it would have taken, I, I would have had to have gone to a designer and I would have had to have paid them, I don't know how much, to come up with six concepts for podcast cover art. I know you can do it in Canva, but you need an account on Canva. You know, even Canva is using AI to take away jobs from designers. So it's, it, you ask what are concerns? Obviously, the, the medical one is one, but obviously as well, for you know, people like designers, these kind of things have to be wildly concerning as well. And then you have the whole data analytics, because 
again, chat GPT. And I, I, I talk about that one because it's the one I use most, but there are lots of others out there as well. But chat GPT has a data, data analytics plugin. And mm. for example, just as a test, I downloaded my podcast stats and then I uploaded them to the data analytics plugin of ChatGPT, and I gave it a wide open question. I said, here's the podcast download stats from my podcast. What are some interesting takeaways from this? And it parsed the CSV file and it came back with a load of insights. And it then said, look, we could do this kind of analysis on it or this kind of analysis on it or this kind of analysis on, or this. Do you want me to proceed and do those? And I just said, yes. And then it started doing those and it started giving uh, Excel spreadsheet links to Excel data, to Excel spreadsheets that are created based on the data. It started throwing up graphs, charting the data, all this kind of stuff. So again, no, I don't think a lot of professional data scientists are going to be put out of work by this. But it means that, you know, companies that might have been thinking about taking on a data scientist might now think twice and go, yeah, Maybe we'll put it off for a while because we can just use the plugin and chat GPT. And as we get further down the line, maybe we'll put off getting a data scientist for another two, three, four months. One thing uh, I just wanted to, to raise with you as well, because this is something people talk about in a, a lot of in the spaces I operate in outside of this, uh, with the creative generative AI is who owns that? That's the question that everyone asks. So yeah, you can create mm -hmm. this cover up. But who actually owns that? Do you own that? Does does the company that generates it own that? What about the artists that it pulled prompts from? That that's the gray space, really. Yeah, I mean, Microsoft have a good one as well in Bing Image Create, and as far as I know, with their Bing Image Create, the image okay. is then yours. So I, I think in their case, at least, it, it's pretty clear who owns it. It's you generated the prompt, so the art is yours. Um, I'm not as sure about DALI 3. I just haven't looked sure. into it, to be honest. Right. Uh, crazy. What about, uh, for, um, what about for things like automation and smart systems? I have, do you have any experience with AI and um, its relation to those? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we all have to an extent because, you know, if you drive a car, the more modern cars are getting the ADAS, you know, advanced driver assistance systems built into them so they can start, you know, telling you when you're veering a little to the left or to the right, getting too close to the, the lanes. Uh, I have a system in my car, which, you know, I can it's, it's cruise control, but it's advanced cruise control. So it can, it can take over, it can start steering, accelerating, decelerating, all that kind of thing. It, you know, when I stop at traffic lights, uh, I don't have to think about when the next car ahead of me pulls off, it does automatically and it pulls off itself. And, you know, this isn't the Tesla. This is just, you know, it, it is an EV, but it's, it's not a wildly advanced one. I mean, the Teslas with their apparently full self-driving, <laughs> um, you know, they are more advanced on that front. And that is all AI that's taking inputs from sensors, uh, sometimes radar, sometimes cameras, sometimes a mix on the vehicles and, you know, watching the road. And I, my car is a, a Nero, a Kia Nero, and it's fantastic. I got to say, I love putting that on when I'm on a long drive on the motorway and just let it take over. Obviously, I don't you know, go to sleep or anything like that. But it means I can relax a bit. I don't have to my I don't have to my foot on the accelerator the whole time. I just keep a watchful eye every so often. Grab the steering wheel to make sure we're. Uh, it, it knows I'm still awake. But other than that, it makes longer trips very very easy. Um, you you also see a lot of automation in industry. We see a lot of data in industry as well. I mean, the the whole advance of IoT means that we are now getting tons more data than we ever had before. And of course, you need AI to parse that data because there's no way a human could. So, you know, the AI comes in, parses the data and then goes, OK, we need to look over here because there's a blip here, which, you know, a normal person might not have seen in a whole sea of data. But of course, that's precisely what AIs are particularly good at. Yeah, that leads me to my next question, which is, 
how reliable is that data, especially in regards to supply chain? Yeah, so the generative AIs that we're seeing, the likes of the chat GPT, the LLMs, they're not reliable in that kind of a scenario because they can have this hallucinatory thing. But there are lots of other types of AI uh, which don't have that and that isn't an issue. And those are the kind of ones you'd be using in those scenarios. So, you know, you've got uh, vision-based AIs, for example, which are great for doing safety assessments. Um, you know, mm. you see trains now with cameras in their undercarriage and they're examining the tracks and they're examining foliage all around them. They're examining the wheels to make sure the wheels are fine. And all this is done with standard cameras, which can examine things at very high speed, much faster than a human eye could and find any issues, find any safety issues and alert. Similarly, in, you know, factories where they're manufacturing, let's say, cars or large sheets of metal for anything, any kind of casting stuff. Again, traditionally, you had people, you know, looking at the output from one of these casting machines and looking for any cracks, any faults, any defects, things like that. But now cameras can do it much more quickly, much more effectively than people can. And so we're starting to see in a lot of factories, vision-based AIs take on that role and the output be far faster and far more reliable. Wow. Uh, we also want to talk to you about uh, the environmental side of things, because you have that whole podcast dedicated to that space. Um, and obviously it's becoming increasingly important these days with new regulations, with public opinion, that we have to have a focus on this uh, area. So I'd love to ask what trends do you see in sustainability and compliance in tech? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> There's a lot going on and it's amazing because, you know, up until 2020, there wasn't a lot of compliance issues really around this kind of area. There wasn't a huge amount of regulation. There was, but it wasn't. We, we've seen a huge amount of changes in the last three and a half years, uh, the likes of which we hadn't seen in 10, 20 years previously. And the kind of things I'm talking about are, there's a new uh, EU deforestry regulation, for example, uh, which is coming into effect at the start of next year. And what it means is if you are a company importing goods into the EU, then you have to be able to show that the goods you're importing into the EU were not responsible for deforestation where they were sourced since December 2020. So you have to be able to go back in time and show that now, this is across seven categories of goods. It's not all goods being imported, but it's things like uh, coffee, it's things like meat, it's things like palm oil, all these kind of things. Rubber is another one. I can't remember the full seven, but those kind of categories are going to expand as well. Uh, wood is another obvious one, uh, another category, but those, those are going to expand. So companies now bringing stuff into the EU, and it's not just European companies, it's any company bringing stuff into the EU has to be able to show that they're not causing deforestation and have to be able to show that no deforestation was caused by the production of these goods since wherever they were sourced since December 2020. So that's, that's a big challenge. And obviously, that's not something you can do with a pen and paper. That's something you obviously need satellite data to be able to show. I, I can't think of another way you could effectively prove it apart from satellite data. So that's, that's a big one there. Uh, you've got a lot of other regulations coming in as well. On the, you know, the S side of ESG, uh, so the S is social. So things like mm -hmm. forced labor regulations, they're coming in. Uh, Germany passed a, a forced, forced labor regulation at the start of this year. Uh, so it, it's effective already uh, for large companies and from the start of next year for all companies. And again, they, the, and, and the onus is on the companies to show that there is no forced labor in their supply chain. And already the three large automotive companies, BMW, Volkswagen and Mercedes, have been 
I don't know if they've been taken to court, but they are being investigated under that law because of apparent forced labor in their supply chains in China. So, you know, this is and these these regulations have teeth. These they're like they're similar to GDPR. The onus is on the manufacturing companies and they are liable for up to four, five, six percent of their global sales if they're not in compliance with this regulation. Uh, so, you know, the, the, so that's that compliance. Then uh, you have climate reporting regulation coming in as well. Uh, it's coming in in Europe. It's already been passed in California. The SEC are discussing it for all of the US. Uh, it's going to come in other regions as well. So uh, this will require companies to report their emissions out to scope three, typically. And if not now, then soon those reports will require will be required to be auditable as well. So again, you, you see very often in companies today that the people responsible for sustainability, the chief sustainability officers, very often they report into the marketing organization, they report into the CMO. And that kind of tells its own story of what these companies feel sustainability is for. Whereas with this shift in regulations and with the increasing rigor that's going to be required around reporting emissions, that function will have to shift to likely the CFO's organization uh, because of the rigor de demanded. So that that's a big shift. And again, there's no way you can report these kind of things without having a totally digitized supply chain. And visibility into your suppliers supply chains as well because scope three goes out that far you've got to be able to show that what you're getting from your suppliers well not you have to be able to show the impact of purchasing from suppliers on your emissions so if you're buying uh parts for cars that you're manufacturing if those parts are made in poland for example they'll likely have a high carbon footprint because the grid in Poland is very coal heavy. If you purchase the same parts from a manufacturer in France, the emissions would likely be far lower because there's a lot of nuclear power in the French grid. So the amount of uh, emissions required to generate electricity in France are significantly lower. So, you know, those kind of things are going to start to be taken into account. There's, there's a lot of other pressures happening as well. It's not just compliance based, but also, you know, boards are starting to take interest in this. Banks and insurance companies are starting to take interest in this. So if you have a significant amount of emissions uh, in your profile, then banks might start to look askance at you. Insurance companies might start to question it. Uh, if you are, for example, going to build a new power plant, if that power plant is going to be powered by fossil fuels, well, then you'll have a hard time getting financing for it. Because if it's going to be powered by coal, you just won't get any money for it from anyone. Because coal is going so much out of fashion, that plant will be shut down in five years maximum. And so there's no way you'll get a return on that investment in five years. So that's just forget it. If it's a gas powered plant, again, it's going to be harder to get financing for it. You will get some, but it'll be at a far higher cost. So the amount of the, 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 the the cost of capitalization of fossil fuel projects is typically in excess of 20%, 20 to 25%, whereas the cost of capitalization of renewable projects is typically sub 5%. So there's a huge gap there, and that delta is increasing. And so just because of that, we're starting to see it's far easier, far faster, and far cheaper to roll out renewably powered projects rather than fossil fuel ones, which is obviously a good thing. And it's not just the finance industry, also employees are taking notice of what their companies are doing. So you're starting to see a lot of employees, activist employees, pressuring their own companies to do the right thing, to lower their emissions, to report on their emissions. And what you see is companies that have a good sustainability story to tell, they find it easier to source new employees and their 
rates of turnover of employees are lower. So it's there, it's the cost of recruitment for companies are typically very high. But if you have a very good sustainability story, your costs of recruitment are lower and your retention rates are higher. So you don't have to recruit as much either. So, you know, those are significant costs to companies, recruitment and retention. And if you can reduce those, that's great. And then on the flip side of it, you have customers, customer acquisition costs are reduced again if you have a good sustainability story that you can tell. You know, the likes of Patagonia and Timberland and people like that. You know, they, Oakley, I I drink Oakley oat milk, for example, with my coffee. (laughs) <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's, that's, that's coffee made with, with Oakley milk. Um, you know, they tell a good sustainability story. They have the carbon footprint of the liter of Oakley on the side of the carton. It's turns out it's about 44, 45. I can't remember exactly. It's either 44 or 45 grams per liter. Is that good? I have no idea because nobody else is doing it. You know, I could get a liter of cow milk or uh, almond milk, put them side by side with the Oakley milk, and they don't tell you how much it costs or how, how much the emissions are. So until everyone is doing that, then it's, it's hard to tell. But on the other hand, because they're doing it, they've got a good name for being that transparent and more people are likely to buy their product. So the cost of customer acquisition for companies that tell a good sustainability story is lower as well. So it's easier and cheaper to get customers. It's easier and cheaper to get good employees because you have serious competition for any jobs you advertise. Uh, Your boards are going to love it. Your finance and insurance companies are going to love it. So it's it's a win, 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 win across the board. Compliance is more regulations coming in this space as well. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's similar to AI in that it's kind of like the topic du jour. Everyone is talking about it, but it's not one that's going to go away. Why do I say that? Because <clears throat> Europe has passed this fit for uh, 55 legislation, which says we have to reduce our emissions 55 percent by 2030. And, you know, out of context, what does that mean? Very hard to tell. But if I tell you that in 2020, when we had the lockdown, our emissions dropped 7 percent, then They went back up 5% in 21 when things started opening up again. So we had a net reduction between 2020 and 2021 of 2%. Now, this 55% is against our 1990 baseline, and we've already reduced in the last few decades. We've actually got our emissions down. So we're actually down about 24% of that 55 already. But that means we still have another 31% to get out of the system between now and 2030, which is just over six years away. So the scale of the changes that we're going to have to see in our systems in the next six years are mind blowing. They really are. And I don't think a lot of people have grasped this. And these are not targets. These are mandated reductions on every country. So this is legally binding on every country, these these emissions reductions. And it's not just Europe. Uh, The Biden administration have said they want to get their emissions down 52% by 2030. China has said they want their emissions to peak by 2030. Now, Bloomberg put put out an article recently saying that the Chinese emissions will actually likely peak next year because China has this habit of coming out with these wildly ambitious goals and then blowing through them years ahead of time. Uh, When China said that it wanted to, I forget the exact numbers, But it produces these five-year plans. And in 2015, its five-year plan for 2020 said it wanted to reach a certain amount of solar. I can't remember exactly how many gigawatts of solar by 2020. And everyone kind of went, yeah, that'll never happen. They reached it in 2018, two years early. And then they said, okay, here's what we want to do now by 2020. So another wildly ambitious solar goal for 2020. They blew through that in 2019. You know, so China has this record uh, it didn't just start in 2015. They've been doing it for, for a couple of decades now. And again, they, they have these wildly ambitious goals for 2030 and 2050 and 2060. And they'll probably get through those ahead of time as well. So the point I'm getting at, China, one of the major economic blocks in the world, the EU, another one, the US, another one, all have very ambitious sustainability goals for 2030 and 2045 and 2050 and 2035, depending on which uh, targets you're looking at. And so... And, and, and that 55% that Europe is trying to get out by 2030, 
that's the low hanging fruit. So the other 45% that's left is going to be much harder to get out. So we so we'll have to work really hard to get the 55% up by 2030. And then the following 20 years, we'll have to work even harder again to get the other 45% out in 20 years. So this is not something that's going away anytime soon. The opposite, it's going to become more and more important with every year that goes by. And so we're going to start to, to see that every single business decision will be weighed not just on its financial implications, but also on its climate implications. I think uh, the great point, wow. amazing point raised. Um, I, I think that... <laughs> so much. Nora's head just exploded. <laughs> as, as this becomes more and more important, I think technology is being focused more and more on the issue. Um, so it, it's a difficult challenge, but I think we're getting better tools uh, to, to deal with these issues as we progress down this path. Definitely, definitely. Well, yeah. So it also seems go on, like Laura, you were going to say something. Yeah, like because there's such an incentive and um, it's mandatory to be transparent about your sustainability. It seems like companies have to have systems in place to present and prove what they're doing. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, my other question is, how do those regulations affect um, inflation and prices? Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. And the short answer is I have no idea. But <laughs> um, I think, first of all, it's a level playing field for everybody. And sure, it requires a bit of extra work on the company side. But it because it's a level playing field, because everyone is dealing with the same regulations, you start to get economies of scale happening as well. And so, I mean, this, the same question could be asked about, you know, the financial regulations that are there for financial reporting. They do put a burden on companies. Uh, because they all have to report and they have all these regulations about how they have to report and they all have to be audited and they have to present audited reports and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it hasn't caused massive inflation and it hasn't put a lot of companies out of business. The opposite, a lot of, a lot of auditing companies and <laughs> the big four have made a lot of money off it. You know, so it, it's just, it moves the money around. You know, again, the auditing firms are going to love this. Uh, a lot of companies with higher emissions are not going to love it so much. Companies with lower emissions are going to like it because they'll be shown to be cleaner. And, you know, they'll have a better story to tell their customers. And so they'll attract more customers. So, yeah, it's it, it's one of these things. It's, 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 you know, moving chess pieces on a board. The money is the money is always there. Just it's depending on where it goes. Mm. Right. Um, there are a couple of other topics we really wanted to talk about, but unfortunately, we've already gone over time. Uh, <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> Amazing discussion. Um, I think we're just going to have to have you back on sometime. That's that's the solution. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, James. <laughs> uh, anytime. But yeah, seriously, thank you for coming on the show and taking the time to speak with us. It's been uh, really, really educational. No, no, not at all. Thank you. Sorry for rattling yeah, on so long. You got me. Uh, you got me talking about something I'm passionate about. So I just wouldn't no. shut up. <laughs> well, it's it's crucial information. <laughs> yeah, I like to Good. see it. Good. Glad glad you think so. Yeah. Well, for everyone else who's who, who's been listening, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, yeah, we're going to have to have Tom back. But tune <laughs> in next folks. time. We'll have another Thanks. guest for you. Thanks.